Dr. James Holly is a distinguished alum of our medical school. He has been extraordinarily supportive of our school and its development and, and has been exceedingly generous um, over the years and is deeply involved in his own community and remains involved with us here in San Antonio. Um, he is an adjunct professor of family and community medicine and the founder and CEO of Southeast Texas Medical Associates, or SETMA. Um, he has led his organization to adopt electronic medical records very early in the ball game, and his organization continues to be recognized for leadership and innovation in the area of health information technology. He writes and lectures extensively on health policy, informatics, and healthcare transformation. I can comment that last year our students got very active in a movement to promote primary care, and Dr. Holly was present and um, providing leadership for that effort that our students initiated as well. And in 2012, last year, he did receive the Distinguished Alumni Award from, from our university. So without further delay, let me invite Dr. Holly to take the microphone. <laughs> We've had one example of a, a walker and, so, and talker, so thank you very much. I'm going to let you keep this. And uh, so I, I walk for uh, a, a really good reason, and that is it's harder to hit me if you're going to shoot me. And uh, I'm not paranoid. Just because you think people are after you doesn't mean you're paranoid. Uh, one of the things I have a habit of doing is answering a question that's been asked previously before I begin my talk. And I want to address this issue about how do we deal with people who already have an infectious disease, such as HIV, and who then participate in high-risk behaviors and develop syphilis or something else. One of the huge problems we have in, in healthcare today is that if you're going to ask somebody to make a change in their life that will result in an improvement in their life, uh, that's going to change something that's beneficial for them, it really is founded on the principle of hope. Uh, progress is a relatively modern concept. Really, it comes from about the 18th century, where people really thought things could get better. Prior to that, an apocalyptic uh, attitude was held by most, that things were going to ultimately blow up and get worse and worse and worse. And of course, we went through a lot of that in the Cold War in the 60s and early 50s about nuclear uh, holocaust. But, uh, what we find in our, our practice in dealing with people is that when we want them to make a change in their behavior for diabetes or for congestive heart failure or for sexual behavior that results in HIV or uh, some other infectious disease, oftentimes we're unsuccessful, not because they don't have enough knowledge, but they don't have a fundamental concept that if they do make that change, it will make a difference. They really don't have hope. And one of the things we deal with and struggle with every day is how do we invest a person with hope? Uh, I want to give you two illustrations very quickly uh, and not take too much of my time to talk about the subject today. Uh, about four and a half years ago, I went into a patient's room on Saturday morning. I was on call and making rounds for my partner. And there was a new patient there that had been our patient for about a month. He had had diabetes for 10 years. He had uh, never been treated uh, to, to a goal. He was losing his eyesight. He was totally uh, uh, incapacitated, had uh, peripheral vascular disease, and multiple other problems. But what he really had was lack of hope. He was angry, hostile, bitter, and mean. The nurse said, you don't want to go see this patient. I said, I love people like that. And so I went in the room, and I did every song and dance. I told him every story. I did everything I could to try to, to bridge the gap between his negative attitude about life and my uh, perhaps exuberant uh, positive one. He wasn't buying any of it. The next day, I discharged him. And I said, I want to see you in my office uh, personally. And I did see him. He was still bitter, mean, hateful, angry. But I discovered some things about him I didn't know in the hospital. Uh, he was disabled. He had no money. He couldn't afford gas to come to the doctor or go to diabetes education. He could only afford four of his nine medications. He uh, could not afford diabetes education, the fees for that. 
He was going blind, but he couldn't afford to see an eye doctor. He had no insurance, no resources, and no hope. After making certain that his care was optimal, I then went into, because we're a patient-centered medical home, both by NCQA and by AAAHC, and we're in the process of applying for URAC because we're going to get all four designations so then I can write critiques with authority about all four and hopefully move this whole process of patient-centered medical home to where it ought to be. And uh, we, he left there that day with our foundation. Every year, our partners give a half million dollars to our foundation from which we pay for the health care of our patients that can't afford it. None of that money can come to us, but it goes to others who won't see our patients if they can't be seen, if they can't afford their care. We paid for his medications. Uh, we gave him a gas card so he could come to the doctor. We waived the fees for the uh, DSME, Diabetes Self-Management Education Program that's ADA approved that we maintain. Uh, we got him an appointment in Houston in an experimental program uh, for eye preservation. Our care coordination department began working with him to help him apply for disability, and it seems like there are a couple other things that we did. He came back six weeks later, and for the first time in 10 years, his diabetes was treated to goal. But more than that, more importantly, he had something I can't prescribe. He had hope. He had joy. He was happy. He was positive. He was making changes in his life for the first time because he really believed there was life after uh, diabetes. He has been my dear friend since that uh, four and a half years ago, and I would love to tell you a lot more stories about him because he is the, he's our patient-centered medical home poster child. Uh, just a great story. But medicine didn't change his life. Knowledge didn't change his life. What changed his life was hope, that he thought there was really a life after diabetes. And if we're going to change people's lives who are HIV positive or who are participating in behaviors where they're going to get other infectious diseases that we all know will destroy their lives, somehow we're going to have to invest hope in them. Another story, very quickly, not too uh, uh, long after that, I went to the hospital early, as is my habit, and I was going to a, see a patient that I'd not known but uh, was on the HMO that I'm the hospitalist for. And the nurse said, you can't go in that room. I said, why? He said, well, he said he's going to kill the next doctor that walks in the room. <laughs> well, that was a novel concept to me. I've known doctors. I might wish to do that too, but uh, I wasn't one of them. And uh, I said, does he have a gun? And they said, we don't think so. I said, good, let's go see him. Well, they got two burly guys by the time I walked down the hall and these two uh, huge guys. I don't know what they did in the hospital, but they were, they were bruisers. And, and they walked in behind me, and here lays in bed a little mousy guy. I mean, you know, uh, milk toast uh, Marvin, if you will. And, and I looked at him, and I thought, this guy is going to threaten to kill somebody? You know, there's two options you could have. You could go in and try to help him, or you could call the cops and put him in jail, because what he committed was a crime. And I, I looked at him, and I said, may I listen to your lungs? And he looked at me like, What? I said, may I listen to your lungs? And he said, yes. You know what had never happened in this man's life? He had no personal autonomy. He had no money, no friends, no family, no job, no future. He had no hope. And the one thing he had power over was his body. And in an attempt to establish power, autonomy, personal dignity, he had said, you're not going to touch me without my permission, but he had never verbalized that. He just did it in hostility. And for the first time, somebody said to him, may I touch you? If I did to you what we physicians commonly do to patients, I'd be arrested because I would be assaulting you. I'd be in your personal space. I'd get closer and closer, and before long, you'd slap me and say, move away, boy. And we do that routinely, and we commonly don't exercise the question, but patients give their permission. But in this case, he wanted to give permission specifically. I listened to his lungs, and I did something I don't do very well. I listened to him for as long as he wanted to talk. Now, you have to understand, uh, I don't know if I have ADD, but I have a short attention span. And uh, I've been married 48 years to so the same lady, and I haven't listened to her for 30 minutes in 48 years, probably collectively. And I stood there and listened to that man for 30 minutes, and I just was, I wasn't gritting my teeth physically. 
Uh, and I was going to listen to him as long as he wanted to talk. And when he finished, I'd been thinking about one thing. How can I empower him? How can I give him a sense of personal dignity, a sense of personal wor worth, autonomy in his life? And I knew I needed to give him power over something. The only thing I had the ability and the power to give him was power over me. So I gave him my cell phone number and I said, call me anytime you have a problem about anything. Well, be careful what you say because you may have to prove it. For the last four years, our foundation has paid his uh, parole fee or probation fees, uh, which we think is a part of patient centered medical home. Well, he has never abused the privilege of calling me, but his, his self esteem and his self worth went up a skyrocket. He had my personal, he had personal, he told his acquaintances, his neighbors, I've got Dr. Holly's cell phone number. I can call him anytime, and he does. But he never has abused it. It's never been a, intrusive. But his life has changed dramatically. Not because of medical knowledge, not because of his information and knowledge, not because we pay for his medication and all the other things he, he needs, but because he has a sense of personal worth and he has hope. I don't know how to do it for everybody, but I know if we're going to change people's lives, somehow we've got to give them hope that there's life after illness. There's life, part of it is how we address them. You know, we don't, have, we don't treat any diabetics in our practice. We're a Jocelyn Diabetes affiliate. Jocelyn's at, uh, in Boston at Harvard, and we're the only multi-specialty group that's a formal affiliate of, of Jocelyn. We don't have a single diabetic in that, in that uh, uh, practice, although we have 8,752 people who have diabetes. But none of them are diabetics. They're not defined by their illness. People who have HIV aren't HIV positive. They're human beings who happen to have an infectious disease. Well, that's not my subject today, but it, it's so important that we refocus our attention on what makes people tick. And what makes them tick is personal uh, self-esteem, personal value, a sense of personal worth. And if we can't give them that in some way, and I've written some articles on that because I think about it a lot. Uh, about how can, I can help someone have a sense of personal worth. And you all deal with that every day. But we need to think about it, and we really need to teach one another how to do that, and then go out and do it. Well, let me get to our subject, and that is uh, the ethics of infectious disease and our, uh, 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 our screening of uh, HIV in our practice. My grandchildren come to our practice, and they're screened. Uh, my wife comes to our practice. I'll show you a video a little bit later if we have time. Uh, of, I had my HIV test drawn on te public television, live TV, just to let people know that even physicians need to be, participate in uh, public health initiatives. Because if we have public health initiatives, unless everybody participates, we diminish the, the value geometrically by every person who refuses to participate. Uh, the, uh, the first thing I want to comment about is that ethics and economics are a major issue. In fact, as this states, uh, the World Health Organization talks about this 1090 divide, where 10% of medical research is devoted to diseases that affect 90% of people. And that really is the case. We, we, have, done, we have done more research on how to perform plastic surgery to augment or de- augment or re-augment uh, various anatomical features on people's bodies than we have on many other things that affect tens of millions of people. The uh, uh, next, the uh, infectious diseases have affected people. The Black Death uh, killed one third of the European population in the 14th century. In eight, 1989, boy that gets it close to home, the flu killed between 20 and 100 million people. Nobody knows how many. Smallpox killed more, three times more people than uh, that developed that uh, that had uh, were killed in wars in the 20th century. Uh, AIDS, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, and things such as SARS and the new SARS that's coming out right now continue to have dramatic consequences. And yet, we don't really have a a clear ethical principle about where we allocate resources for what's really affecting people. You know, we, uh, uh, there's a, a new phenomenon in the world 
that I am a very public opponent of is concierge medicine. Uh, my dearest friend, as I grew up, called me one day and he said, Larry, he lives in Colorado, my wife's doctor is going to become a concierge doctor. And he said, if she'll give him $1,500, he'll give him, uh, uh, give her uh, his cell phone number. I said, 409-504-4517. He said, what's that? I said, I just gave you my cell phone number. Send me $1,500. <laughs> you know, the, uh, how do you take 80 to 90% of your practice and say, hasta la vista, baby. I ain't got no more time for you. I've got people that can pay me real cash up front, and I'm going to triple, quadruple my, my income, and I'm going to cut my work in half. I'm going to cut it back down by 90 or 95 percent. The, uh, the whole idea we're trying to do is increase access to care. I believe that health care is a human right. Don Berwick taught me that. I used to say that, uh, that uh, health care was a right of citizenship, and that was a good idea, but it left out a lot of people. And I began to realize, and I said, well, it's a, uh, uh, healthcare ought to be a, a right of residency in this country. There's a debate going on right now, and a big feud, feud about whether illegal immigrants ought to have access to our health care. I don't what, care what your principle is, but mine is this. I don't know a child who I would deny care to, and until I meet that child, I can't limit access to care by anyone. But Don Berwick was speaking one day, and I, I heard him, and I, he said, health care ought to be a human right. And I suddenly realized that really includes a lot more people than residents or non-residents includes everyone. And I believe that. Now, as a social liberal and a fiscal conservative, I get in lots of trouble. Uh, I, I think we've got to figure out a way to pay for it. And uh, I'm happy to help discuss ways to pay for it because I think there are ways to pay for it effectively. Uh, but we start with the principle that everybody ought to have health care. Uh, here, public safety, security, and liberty. A second reason why the topic of infectious disease deserves further attention, it raises difficult ethical questions of its own. In fact, infected individuals can threaten the health of other individuals. Now change the, uh, the slide. This is the difference between a, uh, a utilitarian and a uh, libertarian. Utilitarians want to figure out how to promote public health, and they really don't care about how they do it. If they need to lock you up, uh, you know, some of you are old enough, as I am, to remember when people had t TB, they would go, somebody would go to court and lock you up for a year, and, and you had no choice in the matter. Now you say, well, that, that advanced public health, but it didn't do much for human rights, did it? And then, of course, libertarians say, Nobody should ever interfere in anybody else's life. Well, I'm not advocating that, but I'm just saying that here's the delicate balance in the whole issue of ethics. Next. The burden of infectious disease is most heavily shouldered by the poor, always. Every disease, but particularly infectious disease. Living circumstances, uh, resources, uh, information, knowledge, the hopelessness. Why should I make a difference? Let me ask you something. Which one of you would control your cholesterol, control your blood pressure, if your greatest hope is that you not be killed in a drive-by shooting that day, and, uh, and that, that is your only hope that you've got, that you don't get shot that day. Well, that's, we have a lot of people living in that kind of environment. Maybe not a majority of people or even a large minority, but we have to deal with people who have that sense of hopelessness and if we're gonna ever change, and the poor, often have that sense of, uh, uh, of hopelessness. Next. We've got to realize that people who have infectious disease are both victim and vector. They, they have the disease, but they also have the capacity to pass the disease. Uh, we're going to comment in a moment, and you all know this, uh, and it's been said today, 72% of people that uh, uh, pass on AIDS don't know they've got it to begin with. Uh, or 72% of new cases are, are uh, uh, caused by people who don't know they're HIV positive. Well, that's the whole idea. The uh, bioethics has failed to see that the patient is both that victim and that vector. Great paper that's referenced for you there. Since uh, the late 80s, when HIV really became a, a real issue, we've really wanted to help control it by identifying people who have HIV so they can be aware. We had a notable case in our community of a physician 
who had a uh, family and declared himself in an alternative lifestyle and, and uh, changed his lifestyle. He was accused of a crime. He was my friend, so I called him one night when I found out about it. I said, I want to help you if I can. Uh, I don't agree with your, uh, what you did, but uh, I'm not going to abandon you. He said this. He said, Larry, I knew if you abandoned me, I had no hope. It was shortly after he was convicted and was awaiting sentence that he discovered he was HIV positive. And everybody ran from him. I would have lunch with him and, and befriend him. And the rumors around town were, were, were amazing. Look at him. He is, he is uh, keeping company with that criminal, that child molester. I wasn't keeping company with a, a criminal or a child molester. He was my friend. He was a human being. He deserved the care and affection that we could appropriately give him. We're not embracing what he did. He had rapid onset of uh, not just HIV, but of AIDS-related uh, disease. And less than a year later, my wife stood by his bedside holding his left hand. And I stood by holding his right hand as he breathed his last, abandoned by everybody. But he did not die alone, and he did not die without hope, though he did die. And as I... As he breathed his last, I looked down, and his fingernail was bleeding, and his blood was dropping on my hand. My wife kind of was startled, and I said, don't worry. I went in, cleaned it up, washed it carefully. Uh, I'm not going to be uh, uh, passive about that. But I said, Carolyn, here's the deal. I think the probability of me developing AIDS from uh, HIV positive from this is so remote, it's not worth discussing. But if I did, would you change what we've done in caring for this man and loving for him, giving him hope in the midst of hopelessness? And he said, she said no, and I said, neither would I. Uh, but we want to know who has HIV. Next. Prevention is the best. You know the best way to treat diabetes? I can give it to you in a very short summary. Don't get it. And there are some types of diabetes that you have the choice. Uh, John has a great story about that, but I can't tell it. And it's not vulgar, but I just can't tell it in mixed company. It would be misunderstood. But uh, the <laughs> about uh, the, uh, the behavior patterns that develop, help people develop diabetes. But just don't get it. And the best way to treat HIV is what? Don't get it. And, uh, and there are effective ways of avoiding getting it. And the ethics of infectious disease is that we've got to We've got to take responsibility for ourselves, and we get others to take responsibility for themselves. It, there is in uh, Chicago, in the uh, Museum of Natural History, there's a checkerboard, and it has a kernel of corn on one uh, square. And the question is asked at the bottom, if you, uh, and this is making a lot of noise, I know, uh, if you uh, double the corn on each succeeding square, how much corn will you have on the 64th square? Does anybody know? You would have enough corn to cover the subcontinent of India eight feet deep. That's the geometric progression principle. So if you influence one person, and I influence one person, that's two, and then four, and eight, and 16, and 64, and if we, double, we influence somebody every six months in seven years, we reach the entire world. Uh, I'm going to stop this. Okay. Do you have the uh, microphone? That's just irritating to me, and I know it's irritating. Okay. Uh, all right, here we go. And so if we each carry the message of learning, do, are you HIV positive? Uh, then uh, others will learn, and if we each are tested, let me ask you a question I asked in Austin at a recent meeting. How many of you have been tested for HIV? Raise your hand. Okay, that's good. But if you haven't been, then you need to be. Not because you think you have HIV, but because you're going to only be able to uh, encourage others to do what you've already done yourself. And when I tell people I had my grandchildren tested, whom I, I have eight, did I mention them? Uh, <laughs> I, I'll resist that, my time's gonna be over. Uh, next, John, the next slide. Here's why people don't get tested. And the one I'll, I wanna focus on is the second one. The doctor never recommended it. It's amazing the influence that we have in healthcare. Uh, people will do what their 
doctor tells them to do, even if it doesn't make sense. And that's why we have so much power when we have to guard it, how we use it so carefully. My mother has always adored doctors and thought they were wonderful. And I graduated from medical school and she had to reconsider. <laughs> they, uh, but she still thinks doctors are pretty special. Next, the uh, ethics of HIV screening. Public health and issues will not succeed without participation of all members of the public. Ethics involves making right and wrong moral choices. In particular, in regard to HIV testing, ethics dictates that everyone should be screened. In regard to HIV screening, the moral behavior is to be tested. And it is an ethical issue. It is a moral issue. It's the same as you won't go up and strike someone. You will respect their person. You need to respect their person by being tested. And then you can encourage them to be tested. I, while I was doing my pre-med work in Waco, I sold life insurance. It's the only thing I've ever been good at that I was ashamed of. And I, I, that's a, a bit of a joke, but I was really good at it. And, and uh, when I finished medical school and I was working in Clifton, Texas, one night a lady came in and delivered a child. The child was an extremist. We took care of the child, and unfortunately the child passed away. I'm sitting with the family, and I said, you know, I hate to say this in this crisis, but I'm, I know you. They said, yes. Six years ago, you show, sold us a life insurance policy that will help bury our child. That's a remarkable coincidence. But, uh, but anyway, I was, I was really good uh, at uh, selling uh, life insurance. But the, uh, while I was, uh, uh, and for the life of me, I just forgot why I've told you that story. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I'll think of it in a minute. The, what? What? Oh, thank you. Uh, exactly right. <laughs> if I didn't have a life insurance policy on myself, if I didn't believe it enough to take life insurance to protect my family, I couldn't sell it to somebody else. So if you won't have your, your you, if you won't be tested, you won't have your family tested, you won't have your friends tested, then you can't get anybody else to be tested. But if you would be tested, uh, then then you can get others to do it. Uh, go ahead. The next next slide. Uh, ethics is the rule of conduct recognized by society. Morals is your personal conduct. And your ethics are dictated by your morals. And we could talk about this all day long. I did an undergraduate degree in history and philosophy, a master's in history. Uh, and so philosophy is very important. I, I don't do things I don't understand the reason for them. And philosophy tells me a lot of reasons why I should do things. Uh, go ahead, next. Regardless of your age, you should be screened. Uh, and after age 13, your children should be screened and go on down. Uh, the CDC, you all know the recommendations. I won't read those. Go ahead again. The uh, routine testing benefits everyone, and no one has the right to act unethically, and everyone is obligated to conduct their health in a way that contributes to the good of the community. By being tested and by allowing your children to be tested, you advance the good of all. Even when you are negative for HIV, your participation in screening adds to the public health. And we've got to understand that. Sometimes people say, well, we've tested 100 people and all of them are negative. Should we stop testing? No, because you can't extrapolate from a small sample to a large population. Next. The, uh, the majority of HIV is transmitted uh, from people unaware of their HIV status. Uh, and this slide tells you that. Next. The, uh, an evolving uh, approach to HIV screening, it's uh, over the past five to seven years, uh, emergency departments have been really good at uh, increasing HIV testing. As I talk to doctors around the country when I, I travel and speak, I, I started asking them, do you do HIV screening? I'm really pleased to tell you that a lot of them do, regularly and routinely. Uh, but barriers still exist uh, uh, at patient, provider, and systems level. Next. Uh, the uh, patient perspective, they'll uh, most of them will accept HIV screening if we uh, recommend it, but some, many of them are perceived they don't need HIV testing because they, they don't uh, believe that they've been exposed or they're afraid that they have been exposed and they don't want to know. Uh, the only thing that can hurt you in life is what you don't know. The only people that today that will die suddenly from HIV are the people that don't know they've got it. You know, you can live a pretty normal life uh, uh, with HIV, if you know it. And uh, so the ethics is you get next. From the provider perspective, uh, concerns about lack of time to offer the test, concerns about ability to facilitate linkage to care. Uh, there's no good reason for providers not to know. Uh, even if you fail in the next two steps, 
you still want to know. Next, the uh, barriers, HI, system barriers. Their lack of champions. Somebody will take responsibility and say, this is good, that we need to do it. Uh, a provider and administrator education understand importance and value of HIV screening. Uh, I was in Boston last year at the Massachusetts Medical Society, and the first speaker asked, how many tasks can you get a doctor to do at each visit? And the, uh, there was a big discussion. I was the third speaker, and I was going to have an hour to speak, and so I just kept quiet because I would answer the question of the whole group. When I got up to answer, I said, let me answer your question for you. You ask, and he said one thing. I said, you have to answer three other questions before you can answer that one question. You have to ask, how important is what you're asking them to do? And how much time does it take? And how much energy does it take? If it's very important, and if it's not, it doesn't take much time, and it doesn't take much energy, and time and energy are different measures, then you can get them to do a lot of things. We ask our providers to do about 40 things at every visit, but they take one second or less or sometimes they take no time at all. And I'm gonna show you in a moment in reporting infectious disease to the state. Uh, I was doing a CME class at Texas A&M University School of Medicine and I wanted to go home because I'd been in Austin speaking, uh, speaking there, I wanted to, uh, but it was a small meeting and Dr. Sherwood, who is an infectious disease uh, professor there, and you probably are familiar with Dr. Sherwood, he was speaking on the ethics of infectious disease. This, none of this is his material. I, I did read his material, uh, but none of it really was relevant to what I wanted to say. But uh, I didn't want to walk out because I thought it would be embarrassing, so I sat down and listened. Best CME class I've ever heard in my life. And he passed out a sheet of paper that had the 78 infectious diseases that physicians are, are accountable for reporting to the state in Texas. I've asked every doctor I've met since then, can you name those? Well, they can get about eight and they start wearing out. I can't name them either. I called John, it was a Saturday, and I said, Monday, I want these in the EMR. I want a template with all these on them, and I want the following things to happen. When the diagnosis is made, I want it to automatically populate that template, automatically send a, a message to our care coordination department, automatically have them report to the state, and then report back to the doctor who's been reported. You know what the doctor had to do? make a diagnosis, nothing else. It took no time, no energy, and it was very important. And guess how, what frequency with which we report those 78 conditions a day? 100% of the time, provable. Because we systematized an issue that was very complex. And, uh, and so if, if it doesn't take much time, and it doesn't take much energy, and it's very important, you get them to do a lot of things. HIV testing is like that. Is it important? Absolutely. Can we systematize it so that it doesn't take much time? Yes, I believe we can, and where it doesn't take much energy. And consequently, I'll show you our, our performance in a bit. The, uh, we're about to even take it further. I was reading recently uh, about some of the work at IBM in 1993 when they were in real trouble as a company. They hired a new CEO and they hired some people they called change agents and they made some radical changes that radically changed IBM, put them on a course to renew their, their company's vigor. And I began to wonder, how can we make such radical changes in healthcare? And I thought, you know, there may be a way we can do it and we might be able to do it right here in Texas. And that is to look at every process everything we do as primary care physicians and see how many of those things require physician or human attention and how many of those things that don't. And can we systematize, can we automate all those things that do not require uh, uh, human attention? We close our practice for a half a day every month and, and uh, for four hours these guys sit there and, and ladies too, sit there and listen to me talk. Uh, I like to talk and they, they have to listen. They, uh, and I asked him, I said, which one of you would be insulted if your patient has diabetes and needed an eye exam if we ordered that eye exam before you saw them? Who would be offended? Whose professional integrity would be compromised? Nobody raised their hand. I said, would that be okay with you? He said, yeah. So John and I, for the four and a half hours this morning from 3 a.m. until we got here at uh, 7.30, uh, we uh, talked about and we designed that program. And we think, I thought it was gonna take two years, we think we can do it in about four months. When a patient makes an appointment, the computers are gonna go out and look at that patient's whole chart. And if they have diabetes, and they haven't had their hemoglobin A1C in the last 90 days, it's gonna order one. 
if they have diabetes and they have, had, had not, have not had a 10, metal, a 10 uh, a gram monofilament foot exam, it's going to order one. If they haven't had their dilated eye exam, it's going to order that. And so if they have CHF and they've had, not had an uh, echocardiogram in two, in two years, it's going to order that. So when the patient comes in, they're going to be handed a sheet of paper and say the following things have been ordered for you, and this is why. It's going to be written in plain English or Spanish if they uh, speak Spanish. And, uh, and it, it may be three pages long. But you know what happens when you give a patient something that has their name on it and their data and their health care plan? They read it. You tear something off a piece of paper, they'll throw it away. Uh, just a tear sheet. And so I think we can take up about 35% of the time physicians have to spend and healthcare providers have to spend in uh, taking care of the routine, ordinary, mundane things that are evidence-based medicine driven, but don't have to be done by a person. And we can expand the time the doctor can uh, spend with the patient, uh, and yet we can improve the quality of care. It's going to be exciting, and I'll be glad to send you a note to tell you if we really succeed, but I think we're going to be able to do it. The, uh, and HIV testing is going to be part of that. And we'll give them the opt-out uh, option. Uh, and that'll probably be the first thing because that's going to be one of the few opt-out things. The rest of them, they, they, uh, they're going to uh, do it or else. They, uh, they, uh, okay, let's go to the next this slide. All right, here we are with, uh, at our HIV program. And I've got a few minutes to uh, go through this. Uh, go next. What we did is uh, we have a pre-visit preventive screening uh, this is where you start, around in, uh, surrounded in yellow. We start every visit there. Now, go to, click the next. Uh, when the button outline, well, it serves yellow here, but it's really green, uh, is it deployed, it launches Sutman's pre-visit screening. Uh, any, I, go to the next. Any item in red, and these colors don't show true here, uh, but if it's in red, it applies to the patient, needs to be done. If it's in gray, it doesn't apply to the patient. If it's in uh, black, it applies to the patient and has been done. But here's what we added. When we started our HIV screening program, we just added, has the patient been screened at least for uh, once for HIV, ages 13 to 64? Uh, and a testing not required if patient refused, testing tested elsewhere or if diagnosis confirmed. And it, if they haven't been screened and they are eligible, you click this button, order HIV screening, three things happen. It sends it to the lab to order the test, it sends it to the chart, and it sends it to charge posting. A single click and a complex task has been reduced to a single, uh, I mean, how long is that, a millisecond? Uh, so we've taken a complex issue and made it easier to do it right than not do it at all. The, uh, and next, and then go, go on to the next. Then uh, uh, we found that a few of our more uh, ingenious uh, staff was just, rather than going through the process, just checking if the patient refused. And we, we uh, uh, sorted that out by calling a bunch of patients, and they said, nobody asked me. And so we then invited them, uh, go ahead next, to uh, come in and, uh, and have them uh, uh, be tested. Because we use the same EMR in the hospital as we do in the clinic, when the hospital in Beaumont, you saw the Beaumont numbers up there, that's our hospital, Baptist Hospital. And when they do an HIV test, we don't want to have to repeat it, so we just put it in our EMR and uh, document whether it's positive or negative. And so the, the collaboration between the hospital and the clinic, and so when we send a patient to the hospital, it documents that they had been HIV tested, and the, uh, so the hospital doesn't have to do it, and we have an in, uh, increasing population density of our, our program. Uh, go ahead next. Uh, I'll go ahead next. Uh, the, uh, and this just says that at the same time we developed the HIV clinical decision support tool, we developed the, the uh, uh, compliance with the Texas State Reportable Conditions. Go to the next. And uh, next, I've already told you that story. Uh, next. All right, here's what happens. This is why we need to report things to the Texas State. I'll just illustrate it for you. We have the, the, uh, the uh, diagnosis made measles without complications on the, the assessment. Next. Uh, go ahead next. It automatically, this is the deployment of all 78 conditions, it automatically puts it there. The provider's done nothing. The provider's gone doing something else. And the uh, next, uh, and uh, the next, uh, next. 
and uh, th this is just where the reportable conditions, if you want to look at it, uh, is on our, in our EMR. Next. Uh, and then you can click to download the form. Next. This is get next. Uh, this is the form that uh, we can, uh, the, uh, it goes to the care coordination. They then do their thing and, and report it to the state. Next. Uh, and, uh, and it deploys a printable version of the initial provider disease reporting form. Next, which is uh, clicked up there. I, this, that slide was out of order. Here's the report. Uh, it can be faxed, emailed, or called. Next, next. Uh, now, let me tell you about our program and how we've tried to promote it. I write a health column every uh, week and have done for, so for 14 years. And two of the columns were on our testing program. And that's where they are, May 26 and June 2, 2011. Next. They, uh, uh, our public policy journal, journey. Uh, the uh, progress was slower than I thought it would be. I thought we could do it really fast and be right up to snuff. Next, the, uh, uh, the deployment events, the one provider said, I found every patient in the group, age group amenable to being tested. Another one said that uh, the uh, uh, patients were resisting because of having to pay for it. I sent an email, email on August 10th, may I appeal to you to initiate the HIV testing. I didn't copy the second sentence was, uh, your firstborn child will be in jeopardy if you don't. Uh, <laughs> I have found that oftentimes threats and abuse will do more good that, with doctors. Now nurse practitioners are mu much easier to get to do things. Next. Uh, one of the questions the patients are asking is who's going to pay for it? We told them if, you don't, uh, if your insurance doesn't pay for it, we'll pay for it. It's not gonna cost you anything. Uh, we started to participate in the CDC program, but it was too complicated. So we set aside $60,000 that we were willing to invest in this program ourselves. At the end of the, uh, the first, uh, from two, uh, uh, July of 2011 to January of 2013, we had spent 59000 and change on testing. We had collected $57,000 in change from insurance companies. So we were down about 2,000. We expected to spend 60,000. It cost us two, so we were way ahead of the game. Uh, next, uh, and these are the insurance companies we found that would pay for it. Uh, next, the, uh, next. These are the results uh, for 2011, 2012, and for January through April 2013. And we report by provider name on our website. We report on over 300 quality metrics by provider name for 2009, 10, 11, 12, and the first quarter of 13. At the end of June, we'll put up the first half. But you can go here and see, how did, how did this character do, Holly? Well, he's still 12.5% uh, down, but uh, it's getting better. This is how many, what percentage of time I did HIV testing on patients that were eligible for testing, 87.4. Uh, we have one of our nurse practitioners, 93.4, but some of our doctors were not. These are new doctors, by the way, I'm sorry, uh, that, uh, that, and you can see in our total uh, clinic was 66.2%. We'd like to see that over 85%, and we think by the end of our third year, which will be July of 2014 that we'll be there, having 85%. Next. Uh, we followed up on those who refused testing. We wrote them a letter. And uh, it was amazing, the result of that letter, because many of them called and said, no one asked me, and they came in and were, were tested. So we've had multiple ways that we've uh, tried to, to get this moving forward. Next, John. Uh, we made public appeals uh, in October of 2011. I had my blood drawn. and. John, is the next one the, uh, yeah. Uh, we're gonna show you a 60 second, or about a 60 second. Uh, this is, okay, this is their drawing my blood on TV. This is live television. Uh, if you're not getting audio. Dr. Uh, Anwar, and how important it is, and I wanted people to see that doctors practice what they preach. And what's happening right now is uh, Courtney Trailer, one of the 18 phlebotomists at uh, SETMA, is drawing my blood, uh, and that uh, they're going to run an HIV test on me, and next week we'll report the results. So this is actually what you do right now for HIV tests. Absolutely. What's happening? If everyone in Beaumont were tested, 
we would expect to find 40 to 45 people who have are HIV positive that uh, don't know they're HIV positive. Many of them would not have high risk behaviors and would not expect to have uh, be HIV positive. The reality is that you can live with HIV. You can live successfully, you can live a normal life. There was a time when you might not want to know because it was kind of a death sentence, you know, 30 years ago, but that's not true anymore. And so you really want to know, my grandchildren come to my clinic, they get tested, everyone gets tested. The only way public health initiatives are, are beneficial is if everyone participates. And next week I'm going to volunteer for all the people at Fox 4 to, to be tested. Now their results will be kept confidential, but everyone should be tested. You know, what you don't know, as you talked about last week, is the only thing that can help, uh, can hurt you. If you don't know that you have high blood pressure, if you don't know you have dyslipidemia, if you don't know that you have diabetes, and there are millions of people that have diabetes and don't know it, if you don't know that you're HIV positive, mm -hmm. we have the benefit and the blessing in this community that we're very concerned about screening and preventing health care, uh, preventive health care. And that's where the difference can be made. If you have it, you need to know it and do something about it. Because like you said, you can live. Uh, you know, the medicine and, and so many Absolutely. things has come so far. I mean, we're seeing right here what, uh, you know, this is actually out of one of the SETMA offices. So tell us about, you know, how, how advanced all this stuff is. And it's, it's yeah. about saving lives. Would you go ahead and do the test? Yes, sir. Which, I mean, would you draw my blood? Oh, you've already done it. Yes, oh, sir, I'm done. I didn't even realize it. <laughs> I, I didn't feel a thing. Courtney uh, Trailer is... Uh, our friend here, and uh, she'd love to draw your blood. Go ahead and uh, go she's from Friends of Amy. We're going to cut that one off and go to the next one because this is the follow up the next week. I told him I was going to tell him my results, but listen. And joining us now is Dr. Anwar of Southeast so, Texas Medical one, Associates. John. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Well, and uh, last week, Dr. Holly kind of what? freaked me out a little bit because I am woozy That's at the it. sight of blood, <laughs> but it was for a good cause, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, he did get an HIV mm -hmm. test. So do you have his results? How does that Actually, work? I do, uh, but much more importantly, I think the philosophy is, is an important part. Uh, what Dr. Holly showed last week was mm -hmm. That is important check for, for HIV. Mm -hmm. uh, in the olden days, people thought HIV is like a death sentence, uh, but not anymore. You can have a normal life. Um, I was supposed to announce his results, uh, mm -hmm. but Dr. Holly sent me a, uh, a letter mm -hmm. to, uh, to, uh, to tell the folks uh, uh, why he's not giving results. Okay. And uh, let me read, if I may. Okay. Uh, uh, Today, it is possible to live successfully with HIV. Prevention is still a goal. Uh, you need to know it. If you have never been screened, go to a health department, uh, department to your personal health care provider or to SEDMA. It is a thing to do for yourself and for your community. After having my HIV test drawn on live television on October 26, 2011, uh, uh, I announced that next week the result will be revealed on television, um, but it occurs to me that if I announce my result and if it is negative, then others will be forced to reveal their test results in what would, which is actually a very personal issue, mm -hmm. which I totally agree. Yes. If everyone that has a negative result reveals that, then those who don't will involuntarily have their results be considered as positive or people will consider that as positive. Mm -hmm. And that obviously will have an impact on men who desperately need to be screened. That's another barrier to their participating in the screening. Consequently, I am not going to announce my test result, and I will encourage other people to publicly announce, do not to, uh, to publicly announce their outcomes, whether positive or negative. We are all in the public health together, whatever the state of our health. Uh, we need to know that I, uh, that we, I, they need to know that I choose to join the overwhelming majority of those with, whose HIV status is known to the healthcare provider and their loved ones. Uh, together, we can continue to push back the fear and the self-imposed ignorance, knowing that that is what uh, that is uh, what you do not know cannot hurt you, as opposed to what the only thing that can hurt you is the thing that you do not know. Mm -hmm. I would encourage all healthcare providers, public officials, educators, ministers, everyone to be tested. Announce to everyone that you've been tested. The results will remain confidential. Encourage all those whose lives have their influence like me, for example. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree with that. I think okay. showing... It, up. it was a remarkable realization for me that to report my test results, which I won't tell you, uh, whether it's positive or negative, I shouldn't do that. Because it would be a barrier to those who really need to be tested that perhaps they wouldn't. And so it's confidential. Uh, it was a, 
it would, I was glad I said that because then it gave me an opportunity to contrast it. I'm sorry that Dr. Anwar didn't read that quite so uh, uh, eloquently, but uh, it's, the whole pr principle is that part of our public policy is we want to, uh, to show that we're going to be tested, but we're not going to tell anybody what the results was. What's the next slide? Uh, barriers to patient participation. Go ahead. We've already gone over that. Uh, go, go on right past that. Uh, the cost. Uh, we've spent, okay, here's the num actual numbers. We've spent... Uh, uh, 50, uh, we've been re reimbursed $54,102. We've spent $58,591. We spent $224 a month that's not reimbursed, which is such an inconsequential amount of money for, for an organization as large as ours. Next, the, uh, the future. And this is important. HIV testing is now a part of SEPMA's healthcare DNA. We'll continue this program until we can report that 100% of those who look to SEPMA for healthcare have been screened. By our own example, my grandchildren were tested when they were visited SEPMA, and by evidence-based medicine, we'll continue this program. Nothing speaks more to our commitment than the statement, even if you don't want to pay or can't, we want you to be tested such that SEPMA will pay the cost. We continue that commitment. And I think that may be the last slide. That's, that's the last slide. I uh, apologize for going so quickly, but I wanted to, to get through as much as I can, and I'd be glad to answer any questions about uh, the ethics, uh, I think it's clear. The only ethical position is to be tested uh, and to keep that test result to yourself. The, uh, as far as our plan, we, uh, we have a systemic solution to a complex problem. We made it easier to do it right than not do it at all. We, uh, we follow up and we audit to make sure that not only that we know who is doing the testing and who isn't, but also those who aren't, are they not doing it for the right reasons? Uh, and we follow up with the patients who have refused so that we can make sure that they have a, a, a legitimate opportunity to be tested. And uh, we will continue this process. Uh, uh, it will just be part of our, no matter what the Texas State does and whether uh, these wonderful ladies uh, we enjoyed a relationship with continue to do it, we will continue to do it. Can I answer any questions or uh, do you have some comments or observations that you would like to uh, add to this discussion? We have a few minutes left. Yes, ma'am. Um, so even if the patient doesn't have health care, it will be paid for by medical or the facility that they're We will pay for it okay. uh, in, in our situation. Uh, I think in, in most uh, uh, emergency departments that are doing this, they, they will absorb that cost. It's not a consequential cost uh, per patient. Um, and, the, uh, uh, and then, of course, the CDC in their contract, they have means for paying for indigent patients who are uninsured people that don't have access to the money. But that should never be a barrier. You know, it, it, would, it, it does grieve me when I hear of somebody that can't get care because of money. Uh, to me, that's a failure of our system and our society. We must get past that. Yes, ma'am. What is the actual approximate cost of it? It varies depending on which machine and which reagents you did. And it goes from, I think, the cheapest, maybe 4 or $5 to 12 or $13, depending on the machine. Uh, I just saw that uh, the report about the Cobus Integra. By the way, our practice had the first Cobus Integra in America. Uh, it was developed in Switzerland. Uh, in 1995, uh, it was deployed in this country. There was not one uh, bought. We, uh, uh, we had a presentation, and it, it, the machine cost $250,000. We were a new, young, small practice, but we knew that we needed quality material. And so we negotiated and negotiated and negotiated and negotiated. And, and uh, finally, the guy said, uh, uh, I said, if you will do what you said, you will sell us this machine for $60,000. You will pay for the two machines that we currently have that we owe money on, uh, and you'll pay those off, and you'll let us keep them. You won't charge us a, anyway, I, it went on, and, and, the, uh, and he finally said, yes, we'll do all of that. About three weeks later, a knock on my door, and the guy stuck his head in and said, are you Dr. Holly? I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm so-and-so, and I'm the national vice president for sales for Roche Integra. And I just want to come down and look a person in the face that did to us what you did and shake your hand and let you know it will never happen again. <laughs> and my partners who had said, well, why didn't you ask for more? I said, you got to know when it's a win-win, when they need a, a, a stellar place to show off the product. 
And so this guy was there, and I said, I want you to tell my partners, what would you have done if we'd asked for one more thing? He said, I told my salesman already, if they ask for one more thing, walk away. We won't sell it to them at any price. And so it, it was a great relationship. But we have a strong history with Roche Integra. But thank you for listening to my story. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. No doubt. You know, the most innovative thing that's happened in asthma treatment for our children and adults was health plans buying a uh, HEPA uh, vacuum cleaner for the home, and they start getting the dander and all the other things out of the home, and they cut down ER visits by 90% and missions by 80%. It's phenomenal, uh, just su such a, something like that. Uh, we've got to stop thinking about medicine and procedures and things we do to patients and cooperate with them and help them improve their, their environment uh, where they live. And if it means that we're gonna pay $100 for a, a vacuum cleaner as opposed to $10,000 for admission to the hospital, just from an economic standpoint, that really makes sense. For want of, you know, the, the man that we paid for his health care for, uh, for four years, uh, we paid $2,200 a quarter if he had not had health care uh, uh, during that period of time, he would have been blind, dead. Uh, but when he went on disability, it was two years before his uh, Medicare kicked in. He couldn't wait two years. You know, we're, if we, as a national policy, paid for all diabetes medications for every patient with diabetes, you know what we would do with uh, uh, dialysis, with blindness, with limb, uh, loss of limb? It would go to the bottom but we can't get past that initial cost. You know what, uh, if we are successful in doing what I think we do by automating and systematizing these, it's gonna initially raise the cost of care. The first year we got really serious about doing uh, immunizations, we spent $1 million, a fact, $1 million, just buying the vaccines. Now that was a Herculean cost for us. Much of that was not reimbursed. But the next year, it was very low. But initially, uh, preventive care is going to be increase the cost. We talk about, but eventually, and it may be five or ten years, it will begin to decrease that cost when we begin reaping the benefits. But uh, yeah, exactly, and I'll give you my card if you want to. It's uh, uh, let's see, it's 282 miles from here, you can do it in four and a half hours. You come visit, we'll buy you a meal, and I'll show you the EMR. It is. It, it, it's phenomenal the things that we're able to do. Framingham, anybody know what Framingham is? It's a town in, in uh, Massachusetts, but it's the longest longitudinal study that's ever been done. 1949 to present, multiple generations of providers and multiple generations of patients. 12 Framingham risk scores have been published. The American Academy of Family Practice in, in uh, August 2010 opined that Every family physician should calculate one risk calculator for their patients every five years. We have done multiple ones every time we see the patient. We deployed all 12 of them, and we added five what-if scenarios. Because see, we want our patients to know if they make a change, it will make a difference. But how do you do that? Well, Framingham, though it's, it's a little bit uh, uh, not precise, but it's pretty good, Framingham gives us a chance to say, here's your risk, here's your age, and here's your cardiac risk. If you change these things, it will reduce that risk to this. We can quantify if you make a change, it will make a difference. And we can calculate those 72 scores in our EMR in less than one second, deploy them so we can show them to the patient, and on their, on their plan of care and treatment plan they get at the end of the visit, it tell, gives them all that information and explains it to them in precise detail 
and it is changing people's behavior. Because we finally can say, if you make a change, it will make a difference. But I'll show you all that. And there's just tons of other things. Oh, you don't have to shut up. Oh. No doubt. There is some research suggesting that the, what the mother does in, with the baby in utero, even if she has type 1 diabetes, we can decrease the innocence of communicating that type 1 diabetic genetic link. Remarkable and, uh, by, by what we do then. Now, I, I do tell you that when I have a patient that's 88 and her first comment, when I was four. <laughs> so, but you're absolutely right. Uh, that's, that's really important. And you know, the great thing about EMR that's, that's built right, you can document that and bring it forward and review it every time you see that patient so it can impact that information. You can bring to bear not what I know or what you know, but what is known. We can update to current literature. Every year, the American Diabetes Association publishes a 100-page uh, update on the state of art of treating diabetes. You know how many providers in our practice that we can get to read that? One, me. And I can update our disease management tool, and it's as if they read it, they're using it. It's remarkable stuff. But anybody else, I, I, our time is up. But I really appreciate your letting me come and uh, enjoyed visiting with you. And I love coming to San Antonio. My heart is here. My school is here. And uh, it's, uh, you're very blessed to have that school here. It was not always the case that this community loved that school, but I know that you do now, and, and well, you should. Anything else? Thank you very much.